We have breaking news out of Gaza tonight. Israeli defense forces say they are carrying out a military operation against Hamas in a specified area in El Shifa Hospital. This is the same hospital in Gaza City that is facing collapse amid Israeli strikes. NBC News correspondent Jay Gray joins me now from Tel Aviv with the latest. Jay? Yeah, and let's get straight to it. We know that this is the largest, the most technically advanced hospital in Gaza and that troops have been surrounding this area for days, saying that they believe command and control operations as well as weapons and, and ammunition depots are inside the hospital. Troops moving in within the last 30 or 40 minutes, as you said, carrying out a precise and targeted operation in a specific area inside that hospital. The team on the ground, we are told by the IDF, includes medics, Arabic speakers, and that this team has undergone specific training for this mission. So they had prepared for this mission for days, apparently, before deciding to move in. Uh, they're also saying that the hospital staff was informed just before soldiers moved on the facility. And, Joy, we should also point out uh, that they are calling on all Hamas terrorists, and I'm quoting the IDF here, uh, inside the hospital to surrender. So uh, this comes after what's been several days of fighting both outside the hospital, airstrikes around the dense neighborhood surrounding the hospital. Hamas has said repeatedly uh, that there are no operatives or operations inside the hospital complex. Uh, the U.S. today uh, came out and said that their intelligence indicates that Hamas is working not only out of this hospital, but other hospitals in the region as well. Uh, Jay, let me ask you a question. How many civilians, do we have a sense of how many civilians, how many patients and doctors are in that hospital? Because our understanding is they're building mass graves to try to put bodies in because they can't and they can neither leave. They don't want to leave their patients, their babies in incubators, et cetera. How many civilians are in that hospital? Yeah, we think thousands. We know that thousands more have left over the last couple of days. And these corridors opened up for several hours by the IDF to move people to the north. So a lot of people have evacuated the hospital, but there still are apparently thousands inside. NBC's Jay Gray, thank you very much. Earlier tonight, after thousands gathered for the March for Israel in Washington, I spoke with two public thinkers about the Israeli-Palestinian debate. Peter Beinart, editor-at-large of Jewish Currents and author of the Beinart Notebook on Substack, and Michael A. Cohen, MSNBC columnist and senior fellow at the Center for Strategic Studies at Tufts University. Thank you both, gentlemen, for being here. Um, Michael, Co Michael A. Cohen, I want to start with you first. Um, I found your piece very interesting, and I want to read a little bit of it today. You talk about, um, in your view, those who are calling for a ceasefire um, being incorrect in what they're looking for. And you write, in 1864, as General William Tecumseh Sherman laid siege to the Confederate city of Atlanta, he penned a letter to the residents of the city that he would soon burn to the ground. You cannot qualify war in harsher terms than I will, he wrote. War is cruelty, and you cannot refine it. Those words ring particularly true today. Consider... Um, well, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to come back and read another part of it later. But explain to me why you believe that the calls for a ceasefire um, are incorrect. I mean, the bottom line is that after October 7th, Israel, like any country in the world, cannot accept having on its border a Hamas government responsible for the atrocities of October 7th. Um, I think it's simply a case where Israel's right to defend itself has a need to defend itself. I mean, even today, there are still Hamas is still firing rockets into Israel. Two people were injured in Tel Aviv, one seriously hurt. Um, so the, the, this is not the ceasefire is sort of a one sided thing. It's not Hamas has no inclination to stop to stop attacking Israel, stop attacking Jews. They've made very clear they continue. They will continue to do so. So I think, you know, what is imperative is for Hamas to be either eradicated or at least severely weakened. And I do think that one beyond the, the, the need to protect Israel and, and to, uh, uh, you know, end the terrorist threat from Hamas, you know, weakening Hamas or eradicating Hamas creates a political opening, um, a political opening because Hamas has for 30 years tried, uh, you know, worked over, over time to undermine the peace process, to undermine a hope for a two-state solution. With Hamas out of the picture, I think you do create a political opening. And that's where, frankly, I'd like, I like to see pressure put on Israel to move forward on a two-state solution and negotiations with the Palestinian Authority. But until Hamas is wiped out or, or weakened, that can't happen. Um, as long as Hamas remains in power in Gaza, there is no hope for peace.
Let me read the second half of it. And if, even if we don't put it up, I'm just going to read it. You said, considering how respected President Joe Biden is in Israel right now, he's precisely the leader who can reassure Israelis that there are, are sacrifices worth making for peace, but those sacrifices won't happen if Hamas remains in power. That is what Michael A. Cohen has said. Peter Beinart, um, I, I understand that you have a different view. So let me ask you what you make of that assessment. So according to Save the Children, more children have been killed in Gaza in this past month than in armed conflict in the entire world in the entire of the last year. So if you're going to say that it's justifiable to kill this many children, it seems to me you have to have really good answers about what the strategy is behind this invasion. I keep on hearing a lot of things. Hamas is going to be eradicated. Hamas is going to be weakened. It's going to be destroyed. We know from America's experience after 9-11, it's easy to get in and depose governments. It's very difficult to get out and stand out up, stand up a government that can stand on its own. If Israel tries to stay in Gaza, it will face an insurgency as far as the eye can see. And that insurgency will be fueled by people whose family Israel has killed, because we know Hamas recruits from bereaved families. If it tries to stand up the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian Authority could not control Gaza in 2007. It's far weaker. Israel will have to guard Mahmoud Abbas's office. So if you're going to justify the killing of all these children, you need very good answers, and I haven't heard them. Michael E. Cohen? Well, I mean, I, I think it's important to be clear what's happening in Gaza. I mean, with the, what's happening here is obviously a tragedy, and we are seeing people needlessly dying, including children and, and, and primarily civilians. But that's a decision in, in large extent that Hamas has made in order to use people as human shields to prevent Israel from attacking them. I mean, we're seeing right now this fight happening around the Al-Shifa hospital. Um, you know, why is that happening? Because Hamas uses hospitals as command centers, military command centers. So I, I think we have to be clear that, you know, you, we can blame Israel for this, but Hamas deserves a great deal of responsibility for the carnage that's being unleashed in Gaza. Um, but in general, I, I think that the, sort of the problem I have a little bit with, with Peter's argument is that, you know, no one would have said after 9-11 we shouldn't attack the terrorists who are responsible for 9-11. For, for um, you know, right now there is a clear and present threat from Hamas in Gaza. We saw that threat. And the idea that insurgency could be worse than what we saw on October 7th seems a bit hard to imagine. I think right now you know, the focus that, needs to be on the urgent threat that is coming from Hamas, a threat that we saw on October 7th and that we still see today. We are still seeing rockets fired into Israel. We are still listening to Hamas leaders talk about how this changes nothing from their perspective. They still intend to use Hamas as a, as a launching let's, pad for attacks. It's, it's in interesting. Let, let, know, me, let when, me let when, Peter when in, because we don't have a ton of time, so I want to let Peter uh, get when back Israel in. When Israel went into southern Lebanon to depose the PLO when they were launching rockets against Israel in the early 1980s, it couldn't imagine anything worse. It got Hezbollah. When the United States went in to depose Saddam Hussein, we couldn't imagine anything worse. We got ISIS. Unless you have a political strategy to create, to deal with the fundamental underlying grievances of the Palestinian people, which are a lack of freedom. You are not creating deterrence in the long run. You're entering a quagmire that is going to leave Israel more wounded and more unsafe than it is today. Well, you're definitely not going to create deterrence if you don't respond to the death of 1,200 of your civilians. I mean, that is There's a different way of responding than this. You can respond in a targeted military way, the way we should have done after 9-11, not by deposing a government and entering a quagmire. Let me, I wish we had more time. I, I really appreciate this conversation because I think this is the bottom line, right, is the question of what, what does one do? Um, and there are a lot of people who disagree with what we did after 9-11. Uh, and Joe Biden did counsel that Israel should not do and repeat the exact same thing. So we can debate whether or not that is what Israel is doing. But I appreciate this conversation. Peter Beinart, Michael A. Cohen, thank you both very much.